uh, and, and how that actually applies in, in real life. Um, next up, we have Michelle Locke, who is an FDA regulatory uh, consultant, and she is answering sort of common questions that have uh, arisen over uh, the last few months, uh, general community questions. So ho hopefully this talk is extremely helpful to your engineering efforts. So Michelle. Hi, everybody. I'm ready to share. Great. So Ben was kind enough to put out um, a request for questions to the group and we got quite a few. Um, the presentation is long in content. I am going to stop on time though, but I wanted to make sure the presentation had an answer to all the questions we did receive. So you at least had them for references. There's also uh, a lot of links to guidance documents and FDA material. Um, so as soon as I get permission to share the screen, I, oh, here we go, I see. You should, you should have permission to share yep. right I, now. Yep. Okay. Let me put it in presentation mode. Okay, so we're gonna go through some of the FAQs and, and also some of the specific questions that were received from the whole helpful engineering uh, teams. And they really broke down into a couple of key categories, that being uh, uh, the regulatory pathway, software applications and cloud, accessories versus components versus finished devices, is it even a medical device, and the supply chain. So I've grouped them according to a uh, similar interest and we're gonna move through them that way because they naturally build upon each other. Okay. So uh, just to get some basic terminology correct, because um, there was a, a, a huge variance in the way the questions were phrased. And so you guys are clear. Um, the word authorization is specific to the emergency use process and the authorization is a result of that uh, preliminary EUA and formal EUA interactive review process. Um, the authorization is uh, just for the course of the public health emergency. It's not the same thing as clearance. Clearance is associated with 510K pre-market notification. It's the result of going through that type of submission process with the FDA. Um, and then there's the term approval or, or that results in the pre-market application process. Um, and that is where the FDA really does a deep dive on all of your data, including clinical data for a class three high risk device. And then you can use the term uh, FDA approval. So for some definitions on uh, accessories versus components versus finished devices to set the tone for the questions, is an accessory, it can be an optional uh, device or feature that a finished device, it, it's, it is a finished device, it's intended to support, supplement, or augment the performance of one or more parent devices. Whereas a component is kind of a fundamental or an integrated piece of the equipment. It's included as part of the finished package and labeled device. Now that doesn't mean that you can't have replacement components available for use after market, but it's, it's not intended to have, first off, the, the equipment's really not intended to work without it. Um, and it's intended to be an integrated, uh, integrated part. Uh, <laughs> a finished device, it's any device or accessory that's suitable for use or capable of functioning regardless of its packaging, labeling, or sterilization. And that's an important innuendo of the finished device definition is a lot of people think that, oh, I, I might be shipping this in bulk or I'm not providing it in the way it's supposed to be used with labeling or sterilization, that's up to the end user. Regardless of those, those configurations, the FDA still classifies those as finished devices. Now, a parent device is a finished device whose performance is supported, supplemented, or augmented by one or more other devices. So the parent device 
will operate in context of those three definitions above. So with that set as kind of uh, the base level of, of our understanding, let's get into the questions about where, where your products fall here. So classification of accessories. Um, traditionally, uh, FDA has a couple of different ways that they have processed this in the past. They have typically inherited the classification of the parent device. And so sometimes you would have accessories that would require a 510K and maybe even a PMA for a class three device, even though they were long, uh, they were low risk devices. So in 2017, FDA issued a new a uh, guidance document, Medical Device Accessories Describing Accessories and Classification Pathways, um, to give companies a new way to bring accessories to market. Now this does require special types of communication with the FDA. If you don't already have a product code or a designation for your accessory, um, you're going to have to file specific type of communications and applications. Um, but this is a way where you can kind of break that concept of your accessory apart from its context with the finished device. This is going to call a, a require you to understand what the benefit risk profile is of the accessory compared to the predicate, the parent device, and then the accessory can potentially be a lower risk than the parent device. So the first question related to these definitions is I want to build an alarm that bolts onto other ventilators. What would this be classified as? So if it's sold, so it, you really have to understand the answer in context of the intended use and the sales model. If it's sold to other ventilator companies and it's the responsibility of the ventilator company to integrate that alarm system into their product, and they are also responsible for the clearance and approval of that product, then they're responsible for the ultimate validation of, of that product. Um, so the classification process begins of an analysis of if, if, this, if this alarm falls in the definition of an accessory to the ventilator or if it's a component to the ventilator. Um, so I didn't have enough uh, context about the alarm how it functioned, if it was aftermarket or, or whatnot, but, but these definitions can, can vary depending on how you're intended to integrate that alarm. Um, I have provided a link to an FDA guidance document on the accessories and components that you can look at to uh, reference those, those terms a little bit in more detail. Um, it's gonna also require you to understand your labeling, promotional materials, Anything that, that describes the intended use um, is all going to go into to defining if that alarm system meets the criteria of being a standalone accessory or if it's going to be a component to, another, to, to the ventilator itself. Um, one thing that, that's really important to uh, consider when you're selling an, a, a, a product that's compatible with a variety of different brands or models is that you really need to understand uh, the validation um, requirements for being interchangeable with all of those things, um, specifically in regards to the performance of alarms and how that can vary depending on the ventilator model. Um, it, it, this, this has a possibility to be quite a large undertaking just to get the appropriate validations in place. Can a single component for a ventilator get FDA clearance or approval, for example, a valve, sensor, or controller? Now, I'm going to start sounding a little bit like a, a broke record here, but I, I, I hope that the takeaway is the importance of understanding the intended use of your product and the FDA pathways available. So if the component does not have a standalone intended use, then generally no, it's not going to require you to get accepted a, a special FDA clearance or approval. In general, the FDA only uh, clears or approves finished devices and accessories, 
not uh, components or things that don't have an intended use in and of themselves as a medical device. So if it turns out that it is a true accessory, um, then yet yeah, some accessories, they can be uh, require clearance or approval um, depending on their intended use. This can be things like software, uh, mobile apps, um, accessories to continuous uh, ventilators have their own product code. So you really have to understand the available product codes that cover the spectrum of ventilator and ventilator associated products. Um, and then again, it's gonna depend on how you package it, how you market it, who you're selling it to, if it's a kit configuration versus individual uh, components. I'm making a valve for a ventilator that could be used on many other ventilators. Do I need FDA clearance or approval just for this part? Would it be easier for the other teams if I did get clearance and approval? So again, if it is sold, to, if this valve is sold to ventilator companies, then the ventilator companies have to take the responsibility for integrating that valve into their product and describing its functionality or testing, et cetera, um, as, as a whole in the context of their own clearance. However, one thing that you could do to answer this second part of your question, which I thought was really a great a great question. What can you do to make it easier for people who want to integrate your product? Well, you can, you can perform um, some basic validation data. You can consider what are maybe some standard performance or technical specifications that you can provide uh, in a way that's going to facilitate adoption and show uh, the universe universality of your, your particular valve application regardless of the ventilator that it could be used in. Our ventilator is very complex and some parts we have built ourselves. Does this count as one FDA application or do we need to get each custom part approved? So the EUA is primarily intended for finished medical devices or accessories to finished devices. That is true for the other types of FDA applications as well outside of the EUA. It's going to depend on your product claims and your intended use. Um, however, under normal circumstances, so if we were talking about a, a 510K, a single FDA submission will suffice because those, those parts are a part of your whole and not something that you're trying to sell as individual medical devices that may or may not be used together. Okay, so we've got a couple where the ultimate question was, did it even meet the definition of a medical device? So I'm building a tool to calibrate ventilators as a part of maintenance. Do I need FDA clearance or approval? Well, a calibration tool is not a medical device in and of itself, but there are some considerations that will make it easier for adoption. Um, you know, for in terms of your design inputs, what specifications do you need so that this tool is versatile with multiple ventilators? Um, what performance measures are you taking as a result of this calibration? Um, what is your process for calibrating the calibrator? Um, QMS possible requirements. How is this calibration going to be documented or recorded or, or is it? These are just some things that, that, may, that you may want to think through that could make it easier for, for market adoption and also uh, minimize the risk that, that what you think might be a universal tool wasn't as universal as, as you anticipated. How do we know if our oxygen concentrator is a medical device or an industrial device? Well, does it have a medical purpose? So we're back to what is the intended use and the intended application? So if it's for use in the diagnosis of a disease or other condition, or in the cure, mitigation, treatment, or prevention of disease, it's a medical device. So if I search the regulation uh, database, the product code database, that gives me links to regulations that define 
particular products intended uses, there is a regulation that governs a portable oxygen generator uh, that is a device intended to release oxygen for respiratory therapy. And if I, I go further in the FDA database, so you can find this definition by clicking through to the, this hyperlink here. But if I was to go to the 510K database itself and put in this CAW product code, I'm going to see all of the 510K submissions that have ever been cleared for a CAW portable oxygen generator. And if I just happened to do this, I don't have the screenshot, but when I did this, um, it just so happened that there were like every single 510K cleared underneath this product code specifically said, described it as oxygen con concentrator in the, the company's name of the product. So regulatory path. What is the process if we update our design? Do we need to re reapply from the start? So if we're talking about the, the emergency use authorization, you as the, the ventilators and some of the other products work where when you receive an emergency use, you get a letter that's specific to your product and the FDA tells you the terms of that uh, of your ability to mark the requirements of your ability to market it during the emergency use. And here is a recent, this, this isn't, I couldn't find um, a, a ventilator letter that was publicly available, but I did find this one. It's a different type of product. But in that letter, the FDA flat out said uh, that this company uh, may request changes to any materials, components, parts, or accessories, and that such requests will be made in consultation and will require the concurrence of this group at FDA. So the answer to your question is you don't need to reapply for the start, but you do have to communicate with the FDA about it, even for the emergency use. Um, and then for sure, when you are um, going into a formal submission after you get clearance or approval, then you have this whole uh, design change control, engineering change control uh, procedures that you have to have in place that give you a mechanism to assess that change. So um, generally speaking, uh, as long as the design change does not change the intended use, the indications for use, it doesn't raise new questions of safety and efficacy of the product. You would complete this engineering change notice assessment process. You conduct a, a regulatory assessment and you would put it um, what is called a letter to file. Um, I have, for your reading enjoyment, included this uh, guidance document on deciding when to submit a change for a 510K. And this has several handy flow charts in the back just to kind of give you a context of the types of changes that, that do and do not typically require uh, submissions for five ten, re resubmissions of 510Ks. Um, if our project receives an EUA letter, can we later get FDA clearance and approval? Would this be a separate application? The EUA is only in effect during the type time of the emergency use de declaration upon termination any products authorized for its use have to be removed from use um, the fda is typically requiring you to have some sort of notification on labeling uh, sometimes stickers on the product on uh, instructions instruction manuals so that that healthcare providers know which products um, when the emergency use is over that they, they can no longer use so after the EUA to continue marketing, um, you have to submit an, a separate application. This could be a 510K, it could be a de novo, it could be a PMA, depending on the classification of your prod, uh, product. Consider doing a pre-submission with the FDA to start a dialogue about what is unique about your technology, what it might be challenging uh, with the FDA because of its uniqueness, and begin this process right away after you receive the EUA letter. 
We are not sure what class our device is and how this affects the FDA timeline and costs. Are there any specific rules for ventilators or is it just a case by case basis? Well, the answer is both. Again, not to sound like a, a broken record, but they are our specific rules. There are different regulations. It's gonna depend on your product's intended use, the specifications, its claims, and its technology. So again, how does the technology for your product compare or contrast in light of other cleared ventilators? Uh, this is a, a concept known as substantial equivalence to the FDA. And this is, this is a, a concept where you don't have to be identical, but you have to make an argument that is what's different about your technology doesn't pose any new questions of safety and efficacy or any new risks that, that the other technology does not already encompass as well. Um, a good place to start uh, this is a, what I call the regulatory pathway assessment. Uh, it's where I personally start all new projects and I have a template available for download uh, on my website for free. Uh, this this is, is, is a generic template and it just kind of gives you an idea of what is typically a first deliverable and what level of detail um, you can know after understanding a, pro a, a proper regulatory pathway. So to give you some context on, on uh, different device classifications and how you know where you fit, the FDA has, has four basic types of, of uh, classifications. Class one tends to be your low risk products. These are 510K exempt. Uh, class twos typically require a 510K. Class threes require a PMA. And then there's a, a, a set of unclassified pre-amendment devices that the bulk of them um, have uh, require a 510K. At each level, there's kind of these stacking levels of controls. You have general controls that apply to every device type. Um, you have special controls that apply to class two and three products. Um, and then you have uh, pre-market pre approval requires a special type of submission. Um, and then at each level, you have a different set of, ex of exemptions that you have to be, be wary of. So uh, this is from the EUA uh, authorization letter. This just gives you an idea of how many different product codes and definitions and regulations there are for ventilators. Um, all of these happen to be class two products and require a 510K. Um, and then this is the uh, EUA table for ventilator tubing connectors and ventilator accessories. And you can see that, that there are still many different regulations, many different product codes, and these can be class one or class two uh, products that will have a variety of requirements. Supply. Sorry, just, just to interrupt quickly, we've, we've got about seven minutes and we've got a few questions popping up now. Uh, do you just want to finish off quickly in two minutes and then we can get to the questions, yep. Michelle? Sure. Um, what I'm going to do is finish the supply chain section. It's pretty quick then I'll just show you the content I have for software and then we can, uh, then you guys can, that's mainly for reference and then we can, we can answer the questions live. Great. Okay, supply chain. If we can't get a specific component because of the supply chain interruptions, can we swap it out for an identical or very similar one? So it's gonna depend on its component and its intended purpose and performance in the finished product but generally you can, as long as you've identified and tested the replacement component and verified that, that what you assumed was like for like really did uh, perform the same way in your finished device when you um, swapped it out. This can include performance testing, maybe biocompatibility, sterility, shelf life uh, considerations. So software, we had a lot of questions about that. I, these are these slides have a lot of detail and a lot of reference guidance document reference documents. So um, you know, be sure to get a copy of the slide deck if these are, were your questions. 
the answers should be fairly standalone here. I'll just go and, and show you. And then we can revisit these if any of the questions were. Cool. Wow, that was that was really good. Hopefully that answered a lot of uh, people's questions around the FDA uh, and the I know we all had these in our minds, so that was great. Um, I will just go through some of the questions. How much time should we realistically expect for a 510k process? Uh, it, that can vary widely. You know, if you assume that, that you have all of your design control documentation, which I touched on what design controls were, in uh, VentCon 1, so you can reference that there. Um, you And you come to me with all of your documents, all of your testing, it all meets uh, what I would say would be, you know, FDA standard expectations. It can take, you know, anywhere from 80 to 120 hours to prepare the 510K. And then when you turn it into the FDA, their clock days for a 510K are supposedly um, 60 days to get you additional information questions and 90 days to clear your 510k. Um, I typically tell people to prepare and brace yourself for a six month total turnaround time for uh, FDA to include their review, their response to you, your time to get your response together back, their time to re-review it. And then right now with COVID, they've already issued guidance documents to say, hey, we, we, we feel the snowball coming and we're doing okay on our turnaround times, but we're not sure how long that's gonna last. Yeah. So you could, you could probably say at the moment EUA would be the, the one to target if during the pandemic. Uh, during the pandemic, yes. But I got a letter back just today for a ventilator assist technology, so it's not, not a ventilator, um, that was very early in concept development when we submitted it. And the, the FDA finally responded and said, hey, are you at design freeze and how much testing have you done and what was it? So even in the EUA, you, you are going to have a quicker turnaround time based off of the maturity of your product and your testing available. Uh, and roughly, so how long do you think that EUA process will be open? You know, I was, I, before we had a spike and I am based in Arizona in the United States and we, we have an outbreak worse than we had when, when everything first started as does several places in the US. But before that, that second surge, I was on the borderline of thinking certain aspects of the EUA were, were going to be over sooner rather than later. I still think, I still see a slowdown in particular types of products approved. Like I'm not seeing as many standalone ventilators as much as non-invasive therapies uh, coming out of the, the FDA for, and, and they are slowing down and they're doing people who have manufacturing capability that have mature designs. It, it's not, they're not coming out at the speed or for the types of things that they did at the beginning. Okay. Um, don't have too much time. I'll try to keep the, the questions fairly generic. And if you have specific questions for Michelle, you can email her about your project. Um, just a generic one, what type of clinical testing is required for the 510k, uh, you know, clinical data, do you need to do animal uh, testing, etc. before you get a, uh, approval? Typically for a 510k, your animal testing is going to be limited to any type of biocompatibility that may be appropriate for your device. Um, and then from there, it's going to depend on how novel is your technology compared to what your possible predicate is? Um, if it is too different, you may not only need clinical data, but you may have to consider de novo instead. If it is uh, maybe where a, clinical, a small clinical study could answer the questions of safety and efficacy, 
you, you might be eligible to submit a small set of the clinical data in a 510K, but typically 510Ks don't require clinical data outside of biocompatibility. Okay, so another question I think would apply to a lot of teams. How should we cover the earlier design work that was not documented according to the documentation requirements? Well, that's not uncommon, even outside of this emergency use for startup companies that, that I typically work with. I advise that, that you put a design control procedure in place right away and that you retrospectively document where you are. Um, the two base level requirements that you, doc, design controls that you need to consider right now are your design trace matrix for your inputs and outputs and your risk management. The, that is, even for an EUA, I have not turned in one EUA without those two documents. Okay, great. I think that's all we have time for. I know um, there are some specific questions. If you do want to contact Michelle, um, she'll be available, I'm sure, through email, and we're happy to discuss that. But I think that was amazing talk. Thank you, Michelle. I Thank think we've all learned a lot. So. I'm going to screenshot the questions I didn't get to, and I will... Um, uh, send them to you later, Ben, and then uh, maybe you can include those with my presentation to the team. Yes, we can type, type some of those out. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Mm -hmm.